How does a slab actually transfer its load to the beam supporting it? It might seem obvious. Gravity pulls the load down, and the beams just take it. But the real question is, how does that load get distributed? And more importantly, how do we simplify it for design? Let's start with the basics. A slab doesn't just carry its load. It passes it on to the beams below. Each part of the slab sends its weight, along with any imposed loads, directly to its supporting beams. But how exactly does this transfer happen? There are various ways to distribute the slab load to the beams, depending on structural assumptions and modeling techniques. However, the simplest and most widely used approaches are the one-way and two-way load distribution methods. These methods help us determine which beams carry the load and how much of it they take. If a slab primarily spans in one direction, things are simple. The load distributes evenly to the supporting beams, and the resulting beam loads are neatly rectangular. This is straightforward to analyze and design because each beam carries a uniform load per unit length. But what if the slab is classified as two-way distribution? Now the load isn't just passing straight down to a single pair of beams, it's being shared between multiple supports. And that's where things get tricky. Instead of a nice uniform rectangle, we end up with trapezoidal and triangular load distributions on the beams. Now, you might be thinking, trapezoidal and triangular loads aren't that bad. And you'd be right, if we only had to analyze a single beam. Software can handle it, and even manual calculations are manageable for a few members. But in a real structure, you have dozens, maybe hundreds of beams, all with varying load distributions. Suddenly, the complexity explodes. Imagine doing hand calculation for hundreds of beam with irregularly shaped loads. So what do we do? We simplify. By converting these irregular loads into an equivalent uniform distributed load, UDL, we make calculations faster, models cleaner, and designs easier to verify. But how do we do that? Let's dive in. Now that we know why we need UDL, let's talk about how we actually do it. There are different ways to convert complex loads into an equivalent uniform load, and each method relies on a key assumption. Let's start with the first one. The first approach is the equivalent maximum shear method. The idea is simple. We assume that the maximum shear force produced by the original load and the equivalent uniform distributed load should be the same. Why? Because shear is a direct result of loading. And matching it ensures that our new load distribution behaves similarly in terms of internal forces. Let us derive the formula by longer span by solving for the trapezoidal load with the pressure of the slab represented by a variable Q. We then assume that the maximum shear produced by the original trapezoidal load is equal to the maximum shear if the load is converted into a UDL. For a symmetrically loaded, simply supported beam, the maximum shear can be found on either of the supports. We will choose support A for simplicity. We use equilibrium principles, considering that the sum of the moments at the other support, B, is equal to zero. This will give us a value of the support reaction at A in terms of pressure Q, the maximum shear for the original trapezoidal load. Next, we solve for the support reaction of the beam with UDL at support A as well. Now that we have both of the supports, we can now assume that they are equal. To recap the principle of the method, what we are after is an equivalent UDL that would give an equal maximum shear as a trapezoidal load. The UDL is represented by variable W2. From the equation we've just obtained, we can isolate W2 and the result is as follows. Let us introduce a new variable M to represent the aspect ratio of the slab panel. Let M 
be the ratio of the shorter to longer span length of the slab, S over L. We already know of this quantity, as we usually use this to check if a slab can be treated as one-way or two-way, in terms of its load distribution. We can then rewrite W2 by introducing M. And this, my friends, is the equivalent UDL for a trapezoidal load, assuming an equivalent maximum shear. Moving on to the shorter span. We solve for the support reactions of both the original triangular load and the equivalent UDL, and the result is as follows. We assume that they are equal and solve for W2. Finally, this will be the equivalent UDL for a triangular load assuming an equivalent maximum shear. The second approach is the equivalent maximum moment method. Here, instead of focusing on shear, we match the maximum bending moment between the original load and the equivalent UDL. Since bending moment is a critical factor in beam design, this method ensures that the simplified load produces the same peak moment effect. Again, the process is straightforward. Determine the maximum moment from the original load and find the UDL that gives the same moment. This method is particularly useful when bending dominates the design, like in longer spans or more flexible beams. We will be using the same support reactions from previous calculation. Recall that for a simply supported beam with symmetrical load, the maximum moment is found at the mid-span. The maximum moment for the trapezoidal load can be calculated by cutting a section at the mid-span, adding moments at that point and equating the value to zero. The final moment is as follows. Same process is used for the UDL. We then assume that the maximum moments are equal, isolate W2, and replace the ratio of S and L with the aspect ratio M. The final equation for the equivalent UDL using equivalent maximum moment is obtained. The same concept is to be applied at the shorter span, assuming that the maximum moments are equal. And so, the equivalent UDL for along the shorter span using equivalent maximum moment can be obtained. The result of the derivation can then be summarized into a tabulation. Take note that I have also added the method for one-way distribution. Notice that in all the methods we used, we only focused on a specific structural response, whether it was shear or moment, and assumed that the result from the original load and the UDL were equal. This means we can actually expand our approach further by considering other response parameters, such as comparing deflections or even exploring alternative methods. It all depends upon our assumptions. So now we have three different methods, each based on a different assumption. But which one should we use? Well, that depends on what matters most in the design. If you're concerned about internal forces, shear or moment-based methods might be best. But if deformation is a key factor, the deflection-based method might be the way to go. The key takeaway? There isn't just one right answer, just the right assumption for the situation. Let's move on to an example to put these methods into practice. We'll determine the equivalent 
UDL loads for beams B1, B2, and B3 using the different methods we've discussed. We'll use the maximum shear method for B1, the maximum moment method for B2, and again, the maximum moment method for B3. Let's break it down step by step. Before we proceed, we need to determine the aspect ratio of each beams. This will also help us determine whether the slab is one-way or two-way. This is important because it affects how the load is distributed to the beams. In a one-way slab, the load is transferred primarily in one direction, while in a two-way slab, the load is distributed in both directions. Here's the layout of the slab and beams. We have four slabs, S1, S2, S3, and S4, and three labeled beams, B1, B2, and B3. The slabs have different pressure loads, 2.3 kilopascals, 4.1 kilopascals, 1.2 kilopascals, and 0.3 kilopascals. Our goal is to determine the equivalent UDL loads on beams B1, B2, and B3 using the methods we've discussed. Based from the aspect ratios, slab one is one way, while the rest of the slabs are all two way. For beam B1, where it carries a portion of S1 and S3, the UDL load of B1 will be the sum of the one-way load distribution from S1 and equivalent UDL along the longer span using equivalent maximum shear from S3. And so the final uniformly distributed load for beam B1 will be as follows. For beam B2, we are required to use method 2. B2 carries a portion of S3 and S4. We take the shorter span equivalent UDL for S3 and the longer span UDL equivalent for S4. The final uniformly distributed load for beam B2 will be. Finally, in B3, the only contributing slab will be S2, since S1 is deemed as one-way slab. At the end of the day, converting complex loads into UDLs is about balancing accuracy with simplicity. We can't always afford to model every tiny detail, but as engineers, we must choose the right assumptions to make our designs both practical and reliable. Thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you on the next one.